Recording in progress. All right. Um, good day and um, welcome to this course, Education and Professional Ethics. A course that reminds you and I as teachers um, of a variety of obligations that we need to be reminded ourselves with as regards to the do's and the don'ts and also how we can actually grow in our profession as teachers right so it's basically a course that deals with you know a number of you know how to put the theories in ethics into practice as it pertains to the teaching profession so welcome to this journey as we begin to look at um, what it is that professional ethics has to do. But first things first, in unit one of this lecture, of this particular course, we're going to look at basically the basics of what um, uh, ethics is all about. Okay, so um, my name is Mwemba Yuvajene, uh, who is going to um, run you through this particular uh, adventure, even as we begin together to look at what it is that teachers need to know in the field of ethics, right? So, first things first, what is ethics? Uh, um, you and I have used this term several times in a variety of ways, you know, call people as being unethical, and um, how do we actually define ethics in our own ways? Okay, and then and, and people have defined this term, this particular concept in many many other ways, um, as, as we are going to, to, to see. Right now, I want you to take a little bit of time to think and write in your own definition, your, your own definition of what you think ethics is, um, uh, on a separate sheet of paper. Okay, and then later on I want you to compare and, and share with these definitions that you have, um, uh, looking at your understanding of what ethics is, um, share it with, with your friends, um, your friends that you are actually seated with. And then looking at uh, what your friends have actually written, how would you rewrite a proper definition of what ethics um, entails, okay, in your own ways? And um, what ideas um, have you actually captured from your friend's definition that may improve your understanding of what ethics is all about? Right. Now, th there are var a variety of definitions that have been given by, you know, individuals as it pertains to uh, ethics. Um, but there are some general definitions that people have agreed upon um, in an attempt to understand the, the field of ethics. And maybe I need, to, um, I need to remind the class from the onset that when we talk about ethics, really, this is a, a philosophical uh, venture. And it's one of the branches in philosophy. Those who have done introduction to philosophy will understand that it's one of those branches of philosophy that um, have been held for uh, centuries and centuries. Um, you know, apart from metaphysics, epistemology, and 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 and, and others, you know, uh, uh, as we discuss axiology, axiology we understand that is actually divided into two. There is an area of ethics and there is also an area of aesthetics. And so, our concentration, therefore, is this philosophical understanding of what ethics is. So, um, there are scholars that have tried to define what ethics is among them um, the Belgium um, uh, understands that when when we talk about ethics it is the area of philosophic philosophical undertaking which studies the moral life of man that is his human life as a person right considered from the point of view of his goodness or his badness so when we look at the the, the, the aspect of philosophy of, of ethics literally, we are look, we are not looking at from a one-sided point of view. We are looking up at the moral 
attitude, the moral um, aptitude of an individual, how does he behave in the good and in the bad, right? And then maybe um, suggest that ethics may be defined as the science of the moral rectitude of human acts in accordance with the first principles of, of, of natural reason. And, and this is one of my best definitions um, for, for your concentration, my best definition of, um, uh, of what ethics is. We talk about the first principles of natural reason. And this suggests, therefore, that uh, much of what, you know, what we have held as individuals from our different orientation, it may be culture, it may be religion, tradition, and many, many other orientations that we may have gone through, they may be the basis for our understanding of what good and what is bad um, as it pertains to, to morality, okay? There, there are others who have suggested also that um, when we talk about philosophy, uh, um, uh, ethics, sorry, it's, it's literally a rational study of the rules of conduct, right? And these rules of conduct are known as morals that describe how people should actually behave, all right? So ethics, therefore, is a rational reflection on, on, on what is right, what is wrong, what is just, what is unjust, what is good, and what is bad in terms of human behavior. Now, this aspect will, come, will be coming out quite clearly when we talk about ethics, the, the concept of human behavior. Ethics is concerned with how we behave as human beings given the circumstances. So ethics refers to the evaluation of moral values. Now, human beings are valuing beings by nature. So that evaluation of those moral values that we claim to hold, okay, the principles, the standards of human conduct, and, and also how we apply these in our daily life as, as it pertains to you know, in, in issues to, to do with determining um, what is acceptable human behavior on the part of, of, of individuals uh, as, a, as persons. So, so some ethical principles, therefore, when we talk about, when we are discussing issues of ethics, maybe um, such things like truthfulness, honesty, loyalty, respect, fairness, and integrity. Now, even as we look at these concepts here, truthfulness and the others, now, what may be true to one individual may not be true to the other individual, okay? And so it depends, these, these terms, these moral terminologies are dependent on what it is that the human being actually um, regards. Now, for instance, you and I may have different dimensions in terms of how, what we believe loyalty is about, right? Very, very important to, to actually understand. Now, the, the others who have suggested that, um, you know, the study of, of the, the ethics is about the study of the moral goodness or the badness of specific free human actions from the perspective of the, forum, uh, the, the first moral principle. Now, there's one aspect that um, in this definition that needs to be emphasized. Talk, take note of free human actions. When we talk about ethics, therefore, what you decide and how you decide to behave is dependent on your freedom, the freedom that you have as an individual. No one will tell you, will suggest to you how to behave, um, where to behave, and, and who to behave with. Okay? It's, it's, it's a free human action um, uh, that, that is understandably said like that. So, what, what is the origin of this uh, particular term, um, this particular concept of ethics? Now, it is actually said that the word ethics is derived from the Latin word ethicus or the Greek word ethicos. Now, in terms of our understanding um, of this term in our English usage, if we have to get the true meaning from the Latin and the Greeks. Ethics, therefore, are in one way or the other an arrangement of decent principles 
okay it is a branch of attitudes which defines what is good for human uh, for, for individuals and also for society and this is very very important to understand that even as we engage ourselves in this um, the freedom to decide what is good and bad we must bear it in mind that whatever we decide to do must be for the good of individuals and also for the good of society. And, and there are many well-known figures, you know, that have said a lot about, about ethics, especially in the Greek world. We have philosophers who have written a lot about, about ethics, like Plato, Aristotle, and we also have modern influences, influences that include such people as Immanuel Kenti, um, Jerome Bethlehem, Bethlehem uh, John Stout Mill, uh, Ross Stevenson, and many, many, many others. I want you to take a look at, just go to the internet and Google out what it is that these individuals have actually contributed in terms of, um, uh, in terms of, 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 of ethics, right? So, therefore, um, ethics is a branch of philosophy that studies human acts from the point of view of their moral value, their goodness, their badness, in relation to man's ultimate end. It is also termed as moral philosophy when it involves systematizing, defending, and recommending concepts of right and wrong, uh, and wrong behavior. So as we, as we will see later on, we will discover that sometimes these ethical uh, aspects can be prescriptive in nature, and sometimes they can also be descriptive in, in, in nature. Okay, what then are the objectives of ethics? When we talk about ethics, why do we need to, to spend so much time on what is the objective of having an understanding of what ethics is all about? Basically, you know, among the objectives of ethics is that it, it, it helps, you know, individuals to understand basic principles of ethics as it were, right? And also it helps individuals you know, to gain some practical knowledge about self, about self, and also about different ethical issues. And we will see how we, these can actually be related in terms of, you know, as regards to the, the, the theories that have actually been put in place in ethics. And among the aims of ethics um, are that um, it, it helps us obtain true and systematic knowledge of upright and authentic human behavior, um, human behavior that is based on universal principles. You know, there are things that we come together on the table, regardless of where you actually come from. You can be in, from Asia, you can be from, you know, from the North America, South America, you can be from the Caribbean. There are points of, of, you know, of interaction that we have the, no, no, when you talk about honesty, honesty is a virtue that is highly accepted by everyone, the whole world. And no, individuals need to be ethical in nature. Okay. So also uh, uh, another um, aim of ethics is is, is there literally to establish a series of norms and a criteria for judging human what human acts. So even if it's a you know it's an individual undertaking. When you talk about ethics, individuals are able to judge you depending on what actions that you, you, you actually um, um, undergo. To study the basic truths about the human nature in order to discover the deepest and most common truths about the human person. Establishing guiding principles that facilitate life in the community. So as we learn these principles, even if we have our own way of behavior that may be that we think may be good for ourselves, as we learn about ethics, it's, it's, it's able to inculcate to to tell us as individuals how we can behave in a most favorable manner when we are in a community of, of friends. For instance, how the type of behavior that you you may portray at home may not necessarily be the same type of behavior that you are likely to portray when you are with your friends at a place of work. 
all right? So it comes up with practices and customs that foster good habits in a, in a personal conduct uh, or what we call virtues as we are going to see, uh, especially when we, deal, when we come to Unit 2. We will look at issues of virtues in a deeper manner. So it also builds personal character. But by trying to learn how to acquire good habits, that can be perfect, all right? And as persons and how to avoid bad habits that actually pervades us. So when we talk about ethics, one of the aims has to do with, you know, it helps us build character, right? We know that we, we come from different orientations as individuals. We come from different families. We have been, we have been oriented to different ways of approaching people, um, treating others. But when we actually learn about ethics, it's, it's able to help us acquire those good habits that may not be prevalent in, in, in our areas where we have been oriented to. And by doing that, we, we, we are likely to develop or acquire or build good habits that can be perfect, right? That can perfect us as individuals and also as persons. And, and, and also orient us, orient us on how to avoid bad habits that, that can actually land, land us in, in big trouble, right? Now, the question that I, I want to ask you is, when we talk about ethics, there are some related terminologies that may come into play, such as norms, morals, um, you know, what are the, the differences between, uh, between these two, between these three, uh, more norms, morals, and, and, and ethics? And what examples can we actually give? So you, you see that um, when we talk about norms, by definition, when we talk about norms, these are standards of proper or acceptable behavior. Standards of proper or acceptable behavior. In our communities and our families where we are found, there are, there are set rules and regulations that have been put in place. And, 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 and when, we, you go, when you actually go against these rules, they, they may be regarded as an acceptable behavior in a family. Because they, it, it may not be what others in that community, others in that family actually believe in. So those are norms the standards of proper or acceptable behavior. And then also, uh, when we talk about morals, we are talking about the principles of right and wrong in, 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 in a behavior of a human being. Well, you know, like we have, like, uh, as, as we have already indicated, when we talk about ethics, it has to do with the rules of behavior that are basically based on ideas about what is morally good and what is morally bad, all right? And there are examples that we can actually cite here. When we talk about norms, now, for example, it is normal. It is a norm in the classroom to listen while others are speaking during discussion. You cannot be talking at the same time. So that is a norm, the standard of proper behavior, of acceptable behavior. So if you are teaching as a teacher and then you pose a question and a student, you point at a student to respond to that question, it is unbecoming for another student to be talking while the other child that you appointed actually will be talking. And that's the reason why they put, put up hands, they raise up hands for you to point at them. So that becomes a norm. An example, a typical example of a moral is, um, is, is a moral, it is moral actually to help someone who is actually in need. Failure to do that then it brings out the issues of immorality. You are not a moral person if you cannot help someone who is actually in need. And then, you know, example for, of, of ethics has to do with stealing. When we talk about stealing, is not ethical. In short, you know, I, I know that there are societies that believe that you can steal a bit as long as you are not caught. Okay, and others will actually even quote the Bible uh, in a very, very foolish manner. Right? So it's unethical to steal, to steal. It means that it's an unbecoming behavior. It is not accepted by all, right? It is not accepted by all. Now, 
so 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 when we talk about norms therefore norms deal with standards of appropriate behavior no there, there is no value judgment by the individual as there is there is with, with, with as regards to morals instead um, when we talk about morals Societies, in most cases, dictate what is actually accepted. Again, we need to mention here that when we talk about norms, they may be dependent according to situation, according to, to circumstances, and according uh, they, they vary in so many ways. It is it, there are norms that may be prevalent in a given society, in a given country, in a given tribe, and even a, in a in a given cultural belonging of some kind. Morals involve value judgments and the principles about right and wrong behavior. So, so in, in short, these can be decided by individuals or by, this, by society. People can sit together and say, okay, let's decide on the, the basis of, of our behavior. So that now, when someone is caught doing what has, not, what has been regarded as an abomination in that particular society, then it is punishable um, uh, as agreed by the members of society. Ethics are therefore based upon rules of what is morally right or bad behavior. Since, since ethics are rules, therefore, we, we, can, we, can, we can simply suggest that they are generally determined by society. And, and these are not the rules of the thumb. They're, 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 they're you know, they're, they're decided by society, and at any point, society can actually can actually revisit them in one way or the other, right? So the the, the, the terms are, are similar in a way, as you have in, as you have seen, in that they they all deal with the issue of right and wrong behavior. Now, you, you notice that they are, they are different in terms of um, they, they are actually different in that. When we talk about norms, norms deal with the societal standards, right? They, they deal with societal standards, the standards that society sets up, while morals involve value judgment by individuals or by society. And then lastly, when we talk about ethics, it, it, ethics are actually based upon rules that are usually dictated by society. You have to abide to them, whether you like it or not. As long as you have agreed together as a corporate entity. So, morals are the basis for the definition of ethics. You can see the interaction here. So, basically, morals, you know, the, 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 the concept, you know, the, 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 the fact is that when we talk about moral, when we talk about value judgment, we are talking about you know, a subsection of what we may call um, ethics. So morals are the basis for the definition of ethics. It, it rules based upon mora morally good or bad behavior. And, and these norms, and also more norms, which we have actually explained as appropriate behavior, is arguably generally moral. So you can see the interaction between, between these three terms as it were. So how do we understand, therefore, how do we understand morality as it were? So first of all, we need to know that, um, that there are different types of goodness in our real world. And uh, I need to mention also that what is good to you may not actually be good to me. So natural goodness, um, the goodness that can that, that an act or that any real thing possesses by the very fact that it actually exists. Issues to do with honest. It exists. We already know that everyone has to be what? Honest. That's a typical example of moral goodness. Right? Technical goodness. The effectiveness or goodness of the technique or the skill used in carrying out a, a, a particular a particular act that's technical goodness and we differ uh, we differ in how in some of these skills what you are skilled with i may not actually be skilled myself and then there's also what we call moral goodness 
Now, this is goodness of the act based on the fact that it is it leads the person closer to their true objective, real and final goal. And this is the emphasis in this particular particular course. Now, I want you to share notes with um, someone you are actually seated with at this particular moment. Um, um, uh, now, what you need to share is um, you need to share what is, looking at what we have so far discussed, what is your understanding, therefore, as you live in this world? What may be your understanding of ethics as a bracket term when you are dealing with norms and morals? Okay? Right. Let's look at now the, the, the nature of ethics. Now, ethics is considered to be a theoretical, or when we get into the areas of philosophy, we are talking about the speculative part, aspect of philosophy, right? So it is considered to be a theoretical, um, normative, and practical science. It doesn't hang in the, in the air. It's practical. It can also be divided into three areas. This is what we call meta-ethics. Um, in the other hand, we call some as, as, as normative ethics and also applied ethics. Okay, And we are going to look at these um, uh, as we go on one by one about on what they actually really are. So as a theoretical science, therefore, because it tries to understand the nature of value judgment, not only value judgment, it also tries to understand the norms of behavior in order to determine the truth about what is really good or what is really evil for the human person. So th this, this, this aspect reminds us that even when we engage ourselves in activities, whether they are bad or good, by this analysis, it suggests, therefore, that our value judgment, the way we value things, the way we value how others behave, what others do, and their norms of behavior, is largely determinant, determined by the truth about what is really good or evil for the human person. For instance, among the issues that we deal with when we are dealing with... Um, when we are dealing with, um, uh, you know, uh, ethics, are uh, issues to do with abortion, right? Now, while we may suggest that abortion is a sign, is, is another way of murder, there are others who, who argue that it may be necessary to conduct abortion when the life of a mother is threatened. And that's what we mean by determining the truth about what is really good, or what is really evil for the human what? For the human person. Alright? Serious issues. Now, as a normative science, we would, would, we, we, we would suggest also that it, it, because it establishes norms or rules of conduct to help people choose what is really good for them, that's why it lays bare the concept of normative science. Now, the formulation of value judgment, therefore, and the norms of behavior with an aim of guiding the freedom of each human being. And we'll see as we come to uh, um, the, the aspects of the teaching profession that in most cases there is value judgment in terms of the, uh, uh, the normative science, in terms of the, the, the ethics, are very, very important because they will then guide the freedom of each human being. When you are found at a school scenario, you will not take it for granted to behave in a way that you want that may infringe on the rights of, um, of others. Right? There are other ways of looking at it, uh, at ethics. Ethics can be divided into two. There are others who have suggested that it can be uh, general ethics, uh, basically basic principles regarding the morality of human acts. Um, the examples that we can give, um, the, the, the last end of man, the moral law, the consciousness, sin and virtues, all these, they're, they're, there is a way in which actually we, we, we actually discuss them. It, it, it can also be, be in terms of the social ethics in which it applies the 
previous mentioned principles of law, consciousness, and others, you know, um, of life of man and as a member of the larger uh, of the larger community. Okay. So scholars, um, you know, we are going to refer to um, even as we discuss issues to do with ethics. As I've indicated, the major ones are Thomas Aquinas, uh, Aristotle, and Plato. They have said a lot about what ethics is all about. So you can Google and see what they have actually said about it. Right, so ethics refers to the evaluation of moral values, as we have seen, principles and standards of human conduct, and also its application in daily life to determine acceptable human behavior. Now, there is a... There's an illustration here of this way, um, this, 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 this image that we can see here. You can see that um, there's ethics at the middle there, and there's right and wrong. It depends on what it is that you are actually experiencing at the middle there that will create that instance whether it could be right or wrong in one way or the other. Okay, so in terms of, of ethics, we're talking about, you know, moral judgment. You have a decision to make at the middle there. Depending on your situation, depending on your circumstances, what would you do? Right? So we said already, these are the, the types of ethics that we have. Now, when we talk about the nature of ethics again, it, 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 it really emphasizes the the four types that we have discussed, descriptive ethics. Um, by descriptive ethics, we are saying what do people think is right, okay, which is quite relative, okay. Normative ethics um, is how should we, how should actually people act. Applied ethics, how do we take normal knowledge and put it into practice? And, and basically, this is what we'll be doing, we'll be venturing to do here. Meta ethics. What does right even mean? Is there right in the world in which we live in a sinful manner? Okay? So, so, so in a nutshell, when you talk about meta-ethics, we know that ethics finds its foundation in meta-ethics. In short, it deals with very important topics such as the basic, basic truths about God. What do we know about God? About creation, about spiritual nature of man and his freedom among others, right? And also, when we talk about normative ethics, it is the study of ethical action. It exists from meta-ethics and descriptive ethics, okay? Applied ethics is the most practical of the three divisions of the philosophy of ethics. It is the actual application of ethical theory for the purpose of choosing an ethical action in a given in a given issue. While descriptive ethics is the study of the people's beliefs about, about morality. They describe what how they would behave and how they will not actually behave. Okay? Right. There, there, there um, I, I want to mention here that um, just a moment. Um, I want to rush into moral dilemmas. This is a very important aspect in the area of philosophy, in the area of ethics. Now, <clears throat> we, we are all engulfed in situations as human beings, in our places of work. There are situations that may require our deepest decision in terms of making, uh, choosing, of making choices as individuals. Choices that may be individual in nature and choices that may be for that may be corporate in nature. Now, dilemmas therefore, by definition, are situations in which you as an individual, you know, in which moral reasons come into conflict in your part. And um, needless to say that or which the application of moral values are actually pro problems in themselves. Beyond that, when we talk about dilemmas, they, they are not clear of the immediate choices or solutions of the problems. 
So, you may find yourself in a situation as a teacher. Even when you know what the solution is, you may find yourself in a big dilemma that will call for quick decision making. Right? Now, moral reasons also could be rights. They could be duties. They could be goods or obligations. These situations do not mean that things had gone bad or had gone wrong at all. But basically, they only indicate the presence of the moral complexity. So this makes the decision-making complex. For example, we can cite an example of a person who is promised to meet a friend for dinner, but he has to help his uncle who is involved in an accident. In short, you, the invited, has to fix your priority. Where do you go? Your friend needs you and your uncle needs you. So you have to make a decision for that. So there are many difficulties in arriving at the solution to the problems in, in, in terms of, uh, of dilemma. Now, there are three complex situations leading to uh, moral dilemmas. Um, basically, we have what we call the problem of vagueness, when, when the situation is vague. Now, what we mean here is that um, one is unable to distinguish between good and bad, between right or wrong, between principles, all right? Good means an action is what is obligatory. For example, code of ethics specifies what one should obey. The gift, you know, the laws and the standards that they follow, or how to follow standards. How can you refuse a bribe? How to accept the gift if, if you are given a gift as an individual, okay? How, how do you maintain confidentiality as a teacher? Now, the problem of conflicting reason is the second complex situation, right? The problem of conflicting reason. Now here, one is unable to choose between two good moral solutions. In, in which case, you have to fix priority first. And, and you are going to use knowledge or a value system in order for you to, to fix that uh, particular, uh, uh, particular uh, uh, morality, okay? Moral solution. The third one is that it is, it has to do with the problem of disagreement. Now, what we mean here is that uh, there, there may be two or more solutions and none of them may be mandatory. Solutions that you may need to, you know, to implement, to, to, to get along. Now, these solutions may be better, they may be worse in some respect, but not in any aspects, not in all aspects. Now, one has to interpret, one has to apply different moral reasons. How do you arrive at that particular moral reason? Okay? And, and, and also analyze and rank those decisions so that you come up with something that may not be a hindrance to others. In short, you select the best suitable under the existing and the most probable condition uh, um, uh, whatsoever. Now, <clears throat> these are critical issues in the area of, of, of ethics. Okay? So... That's it. All right. Welcome back. Um, so, so far, what we have looked at is, um, you know, the origin of the term um, um, ethics, the forms of ethics or the types, if you can, if you like. Um, the objectives at the ends of ethics um, and, and also the, the definition of what a dilemma is, the, the distinction between ethics, um, between ethics, morality, and also norms and with each other. And we, 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 we saw also 
um, how we defined the term um, dilemma, moral dilemmas, and how important we must take into account what, what these are, especially as it pertains to teachers. So basically there are steps to solving a dilemma. Um, among them, I will list some of them. The, the, the logical steps in confronting uh, moral dilemmas include, number one, identification of the moral factors and reasons. Uh, and in here, by, by implication, we mean you, you as an individual, you need to have the clarity to identify the relevant moral values um, from among duties, from among rights, from among goods and, and obligations um, as, as obtained uh, in an inquiry. So b before you, you know, before you, you confront a moral dilemma, you must be able to identify the moral factors and reasons behind that particular occurrence. Secondly, it's a collection of all information, data and facts. Um, this can be factual inquiry, um, which may be relevant to that particular uh, situation. We don't want to, we don't want to, to, to rush into decision making without having um, 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 empirical evidence about an, a particular action. Then rank the moral options, um, you know, like for instance, we talked about abortion. What what could what is it that may warrant abortion at a given time? So you rank the moral options, uh, priority in application through value systems. What do you value? Uh, I, I know others would say, okay, um, even if it's a threat to the mother, as long as I'm a Christian, if if it if if, if I need to die, let me die and let my child. So. so and let my child leave. So those are the values, the value systems that people actually have. And also, it's obligatory, all right, acceptable, not acceptable, damaging, and most damaging. All these uh, are, are, rank, are, are, are the ranks for moral options that we can take, take note of. Right? So then also generate alternative courses of action um, to resolve that particular uh, dilemma. Um, you can write down the main options that you want to 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 incorporate, and in case there are other sub options as a matrix or a decision tree, um, to, just to ensure that all options are actually included. Discuss with colleagues and 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 obtain their pers perspectives. Um, sometimes in our decision making, we we also need to incorporate others to help us. Um, come up with ideas about our choices. Deciding upon a final course of action based on priority fixed or assumed. If there is no ideal solution, what do you do? We arrive at a partially satisfactory or satisfactory um, uh, solution that would be um, that will actually work well with us. Right. So basically that's what we can talk about the moral dilemmas. Um, in, in, in as far as an understanding of what concept is. Now, we'll quickly move on to look at the ethical theories. Now, from the onset, I want to mention here that our way of making decisions, behaviors, and you know, in, 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 a, in, a, in a scientific manner, may be dependent on the ethical theories that have been established by others. Okay, so we'll look at some of these and how they actually apply to our decision making. So basically, they are, uh, uh, these are a very large number of, uh, you know, ethical or what we, we can call the moral theories. And these ethical theories may, in one way or the other, actually help in answering a number of moral questions that um, people, you know, um, undergo. So these theories have been developed over time, centuries and centuries ago, starting with the Greeks, um, you know, then the major regions of the Middle East, they, they incorporated these Western philosophers and many, many others. To this day, others are still developing these theories, um, uh, looking as, 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 in, as, as the development of behavior um, uh, proceeds in the world. So th these theories offer a framework, therefore, for, for, for trying to evaluate, you know, an ethical problem, and in, in some cases, a preferring 
solution. Now, the theories basically um, tend to differ in how priorities are calculated and sometimes how priority, priorities are assigned to the different factors of the ethical problems that may actually be available at that particular time. So when you talk about ethical theories, these actually provide part of decision-making foundations for decision-making. When ethics are in play, because these theories represent viewpoints from which individuals try to seek guidance as they make decisions. If I have to make a decision based on, you know, what I've heard or what I've read, this is where theories actually come in. So each theory emphasizes different points, a different decision-making style. They involve a decision rule, such as predicting the outcome and following one's duties to others um, in a way that they will be able to reach what the individual considers is an ethical correct decision. Okay? So basically, these theories help us to make decisions in a rational manner. Okay? Now, what, what are the uses of these theories and what is the criteria for their use? So basically, the ethical theories are useful in many, many respects. Among them, in understanding moral dilemmas. Remember what we discussed earlier on. So, they tend to provide clarity of some kind. They, they provide consistency. They provide systematic and comprehensive understanding of, 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 of issues to do with behavior. Secondly, they provide helpful practical guidance in moral issues towards the solution. Remember, one of the types of, of ethics we discussed was applied ethics, where we, we, we deduce theory and then um, to practice. So as we look at theory, what is it that can help us um, when we have theorized? What are some of the aspects that we can borrow in order for us to live in a perfect world? Justifying professional obligations and decision making, which is part of the hope, most, most part of what we're going to be discussing in this particular course. Justifying professional obligations. Now, we know that each, each, each particular profession has obligations that they want to meet. So what is the justification for that? So this is where uh, theories come in. They explain why people need to behave in a particular manner. And then also in relating to ordinary and professional morality. We live in a community of practice. In which case... We have different obligations that we give on each other, different rules and and you know and laws that may govern each particular uh, each particular profession. So th there are different criteria that may be applied for evaluating various ethical theories, and and also even as we decide upon which one would be the best. So among these criteria, I'll run them through. To, um, they include the, the theory that the theory must be clear. It must be coherent. Right? It must be coherently formulated with concepts that are logically connected to each other. Number two, you know, another criteria is that there must be internal consistency. In which case here we, we are emphasizing that none of its principles must be conflicting with any other of these of, of other principles and theories. And then also another criteria um, that may be applied to evaluating various ethical theories and, and, and trying to, de to decide upon which one is the best is the, the fact that the theory and its defense must depend only upon facts, no falsehood. Right? And also it must organize basic moral values in systematic and comprehensive manner. Alright? It is to fix priority of values and provide guidance in all the situations. It must provide guidance compatible with our moral convictions, our judgments, and also about our concrete situations. So what, whatever we're going to 
whatever we're going to decide upon in, in, in terms of these criteria, they must have in us to give us a, a semblance of the concrete situations that may be of help to us even as we make decisions pertaining to, um, to, to, to life. So theories and judgments are continuously adjusted to each other until we reach a reflective equilibrium. So we keep on adjusting these. Most of the theories um, we, we will not hear as we go on that. Um, they, they, they tend to converge or they tend to meet towards the welfare of humanity. So they all talk about the welfare of the humanity. What is it? What is our obligation towards each other? So the, the, the duty ethics and, and right ethics differ in, in, you know, in different extents of their emphasis. But they remain complementary in all situations. They always remain complementary. Okay. Now, what are these ethical theories, or if you can, if you if if you may call them approaches? Now, there, there are several ethical theories that have been developed over different times. Each of them tend to stress certain ethical principles or right or features of some kind. So we will, we will note that even as we go through these theories, each of these theories actually stresses a view. And many times we, we will tend to, to find that these theories tend to meet or converge and reinforce the ethics in deciding upon the actions and justifying the results that are likely to to be got to, to to be you know to to be gotten as a result of such um, actions. So the the first theory that we are going to discuss is what we call the utilitarian um, theory. Now, utilitarian theory, the, the the term utilitarianism was actually conceived in the um, if my memory serves right, in the 19th century, by a gentleman called uh, called Jerome Bathen, uh, Jerome Bathen, with his friend John Stout, Stout Mill. They 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 developed this to help legislators determine which laws were most basic uh, were most best. For their time. So they, they therefore suggested that the, the standard of right conduct is maximization of good consequences. Maximization of good consequences. Now, in their view, good consequences meant that either utilities or the balances of good over evil. Now, you take note that utilitarianism is gotten from the, from the word utilities. Now, in short, their understanding of, um, of this particular theory is that it, it weighs the cost and the benefits. When, in, in short, the right actions, according to them, are the ones that produce the greatest satisfaction of the preference, preferences of the affected people. In short, if someone needs to die in order to save so many people, then let it be. The approach, remember we said, weighs the costs and the benefits. Right? Now, in analyzing an issue in this particular theory, Mills and others and his friends suggested that we have to identify the various causes of actions that may be available to us. We don't need to rush to make decisions, more especially as it pertains to moral decisions. So we need to identify the various causes. Do we have any alternative actions that are available? And then they also suggest that we need to ask who will be affected by each action. And what are the benefits? What are the, uh, the, the harms that will be derived from each action? 
right? And then choose the action that will produce the greatest benefits and the least harm. So the ethical action is the one that provides the greatest good for the greatest number of people. That's what a Titanism theory in ethics actually suggests. Okay? Now, there are, there are basically two types of utilitarianism. There is what they call um, the act utilitarian, act utilitarian theory that was actually proposed by Mill, um, which focuses on actions rather than on general rules. Now, forget about rules as long as the action seems perfect according to act utilitarianism. Now, in short, Mills suggests that an action is right only if it generates the most overall good for the most people that are involved. Sacrifice. And, and in this, actually, I, I, I'm led to think about God's decision in allowing Jesus his only begotten son from heaven to come and die for each one of us. He was ready to lose him to save the most. The second type of utilitarian theory is the, the utilitarian theory that was developed by Richard Black, which stressed on the rules such as do not steal, do no, do no harm to others, do not bribe, as of primary importance. He, he therefore suggested that um, individual actions are right when they are required by a set of rules. And this set of rules must be able to maximize the public, public good. So, in short, if we have to set rules and regulations, those rules and regulations must be for the maximization of the public good. Don't put rules and regulations that will, that will, you know, that will, will, will destroy people's liberties and freedoms, right? So the actualitarian theory permitted a few moral actions. Hence, there was need to develop rule utilitarian theory to establish morality and justice. So we see that in act utilitarian justice may not be there. For example, we can cite an example of, you know, we say that stealing an old computer from the employer will actually benefit the employee more than the loss of the employer because it's odd. Right? So as per act utilitarian this action is actually right. Because something is odd, it's not used. So if you steal it from your employer, in, in this particular um, theory, then it's, it's, it's just okay. Right? Of course, there may be conflicts in, in, in our understanding of this. But, but when you talk about rule utilitarian, it actually observes this as a wrong step because the employee should act as faithful agent or as a trustee of the employees. Now, in another example, some indisciplined engineers are terminated with the blame for the mistakes they have not committed. So here, the process is unfair, although this results in promotion of overall good. Even if they do not do that action, the mere fact that their, their job has been terminated will send a signal to the rest of the workers that stealing is bad. Right? Okay. So that's what we can, we can talk about um, utilitarianism theory. There, there, there is also another theory known as the duty ethics. Now, the duty ethics theory was actually proposed by Immanuel Kant. Now, what does it say? It suggests that um, 
Actions are consequences of performance of one's duty, such as being honest, not cause suffering of others, being fair to others, including the meek and the weak, being grateful, keeping promises. All these are duty ethics aspects. Now, the, the stress, therefore, in this particular theory is on the universal principle of respect for autonomy. For example, respect and rationality of persons. You need to think big when you are actually regarding one person in one way or the other. So, as, for, as per, per Kent's analysis, for him he suggests that we have duties to ourselves as individuals, as we are rational and autonomous beings. So, we must have a duty not to commit suicide. So no one should 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 be depressed to an extent, extent that you you think of committing suicide because you have you have a duty to your fellow human beings on earth. Right? So we have a duty not to commit suicide, a duty to develop our talents and a duty to avoid harmful drugs because they may actually affect other human beings. So Kant insisted that uh, when we talk about moral duties, th these are categorical imperatives. In short, by this he meant that they are commands that we impose on ourselves as well as other rational beings. For example, we should be honest because honest is required by duty. We need just need to be honest. A businessman is to be honest because honest pays in terms of profits from customers and also in terms of avoiding jail when you are actually dishonest. Right? So, on the other hand, the duty ethics theory, as enunciated by John Rao, gave importance to the actions that could that would be voluntarily agreed upon by all human beings concerned assuming impartiality now Rawls view emphasized that um, the autonomy of each person exercises in forming agreements with other irrational people so he basically proposed two basic moral principles what are those principles? Number one, he says that uh, each person is actually entitled to the most extensive amount of liberty. Liberty that is compatible with an equal amount for others. Each individual is entitled for that. Secondly, he says uh, differences in social power and economic benefits are justified only when they are likely to benefit everyone, including members of the most disadvantaged groups. Very, very important. Quite interesting analysis of the theory. Right? So when, when, when you want to consider differences in social power and economic benefits, you can only justify that to the extent that each, every, each and every human being is able to benefit and, 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 and it includes members of the disadvantaged groups, the poor, right? So the first principle of primary importance should therefore be satisfied first without basic liberties. Rao says other economic and social benefits cannot be sustained for a long time. So the second principle therefore insists that to allow some people with great wealth and power is justified only and only when all other groups are benefiting. So if you have to advantage people in, in, in positions of authority, advantage them because they need to help others. So in the business scenario, for example, the free enterprise is, is permissible so far as it provides the capital needed to invest and also to prosper, 
thereby making good opportunities to the public and taxes to fund the government spending on the welfare schemes on the poor. And, and this tends to be, to be the quarrels that capitalists and, 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 you know, and socialists tend to have. But by implication, it is suggested here that capitalism, as long as, it's able to, as, it's, as long as it is able to help the community on the ground, could be a good way to go in terms of business. Right. The third theory is the rights theory. Now, rights, as, as you know, are entitled, entitlement to act or to have another individual act in a particular or certain way. So, so minimally, when we talk about rights, they serve as a protective barrier. They, they tend to shield individuals from unjustified infringement of their moral agents by others. So for every right, we have a corresponding duty of non-interference. Okay? Each human being, and you know, rights are being, are being propagated in the world all over. So the rights approach to ethics has its roots in the 18th century philosopher uh, known as Immanuel Kenti. Immanuel Kenti basically focused on the individual's right to choose for himself from mere things. Right? Now, according to him, what makes human beings different from mere things is that uh, people have dignity based on their ability to choose freely what they will do with their lives. Freedom of speech, rights to liberty. And they have a fundamental moral right to have these choices respected. So, in short, people are not objects to be manipulated. It is a violation of human dignity to use people in ways they do not freely choose. That's the emphasis, right? Now, there are other rights that he actually advocated for including the right to access the truth. And I know that uh, the media fraternity, especially in, in Africa, have been calling for this particular right. The right of privacy, the right not to be injured, the right to, 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 to what is actually agreed. These are uh, um, uh, rights that he actually uh, advocated for. Right? Now, in deciding whether an action is moral or immoral, we therefore must ask ourselves, does the action respect the moral rights of everyone? Actions are wrong to the extent that they violate the rights of individuals. The more serious is the violation, the more wrongful is the action. In short, when we talk about the rights theory, as promoted by John Locke, it states that the actions are right if they respect human rights of everyone who is actually affected. And so he actually tends to propose that, um, that there are basically three basic human rights. According to John Locke, the, 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 the three basic human rights are life, liberty, and property. Reason for him was very simple. He viewed his views were reflected in the modern American society when Jefferson declared the basic rights as life, liberty, and pursuit of knowledge. So he, he tended to, to balance it up in that manner. So others, uh, as per Melden's theory based on rights, he actually suggested that nature mandates that we should not harm others' life. We should not harm others' health others' liberty or property. He allowed welfare rights also for living a decent human life. He highlighted what the rights should be based on the social welfare system. All right? So human rights um, basically are rights um, are explained in two forms, namely uh, liberty rights and welfare rights. By liberty rights here is meant rights to exercise one's liberty 
and stresses duties on other people not to interfere with one's freedom. So basically, they talk about the four features of liberty um, and, um, or rights, uh, which they also called moral rights, which lay the base for government administration anywhere in, in our governance system. And these, these include the rights, that rights are natural insofar as they are not invaded or created by government. Because in most cases, governments actually want to, want to abuse these rights. Secondly, they are universal as they do not change from country to, to country. They are, they are three, number three, they are usually equal since the rights are the same for all people, irrespective of caste, irrespective of, 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 of race, irrespective of creed, and even respect of sex. Number four, they are inalienable. In short, we are saying one cannot hand over his rights to another person, such as selling yourself to slavery. You can do that, right? So basically, those are the, 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 you know, the four features of liberty rights, which are known as the moral rights. There are also what we call economic rights. Um, in the free market economy, the free market economy, you, you understand that the, the very purpose of existence of manufacturers, the, the sellers and the service providers, is basically to save the consumer, isn't it? Now, the consumer is eligible to exercise some rights. And, and we know that consumers basically have six basic rights. That includes the right to information. They, they want to know the ingredients. They, 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 you know, what is it that is, con that is, is mixed in this particular ingredient, uh, um, this particular foodstuff or whatever item it is. Right to safety, right to choice, right to be heard, right to, to, re to, to redress, all, and also right to consumer education. And that's why some countries have consumer um, institutions that look at the welfare of people who actually buy, right? So basically, the the, the other theory is virtual theory. The, the, this emphasizes on the character rather than the rights or duties. So the character is the pattern of virtues, right? The theory advocated by Aristotle stressed on the tendency to act at proper balance between extremes of conduct, all right? extremes of emotions, desire, attitudes, to find the golden mean between the extremes of excess or, or between deficiencies. Now, there, there are examples that are shown um, that illustrate this particular theory here. Okay? So we have virtue there, um, uh, in as far as truthfulness governs, uh, which governs communication, um, uh, revealing all in violation of Tact and confidentiality in excess, golden mean, we talk about um, ne necessary and sufficient to proper person, deficiency has to do with secretive, with normal secretive. What about courage? Um, uh, on courage here, we talk about facing danger, risk, generosity, and giving. Um, and, and so if you look at this, there's, there's, there's an illustration of, um, of, of, of what all these um, the virtues and their excesses, the golden mean and their deficiencies have to do with issues to do with ethics. Right? There's um, self-realization. Now, under, under ethics, under right ethics, um, ethics right action consists in seeking self-fulfillment. Now, in one version of, of this theory, it is said that the self to be realized is actually defined by carrying relationships with other individuals in society. In other words, another version um, called the, the ethical egoism, in which case it is meant the right action as, as, as consisting in, in always promoting what is good for you as an individual. Not caring and uh, no caring and society relationships are actually assumed in this particular particular undertaking, right? 
Then there is also what we call the justice or fairness theory. Now, the justice or fairness approach to ethics has its roots in the teachings of the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle, who basically said that um, equals should be treated equally and unequals should be treated unequally. Poor to poor, rich to rich. Now, the basic moral question in this uh, theory um, is how fair is an action? Does it treat everyone in the same way? Or does it show favoritism or discrimination? Now, here, issues create controversies simply because we do not bomber, we, we, sorry, we do not bother to check the fairness or the justice that is at play. So, Favoritism in, 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 in justice um, gives benefits to some people without a justifiable reason for singling them out. Discrimination imposes burdens on people who are basically no different from those of whom burdens are not imposed. So basically, both favoritism and, and, and discrimination, according to Aristotle, are unjust and they are extremely wrong. All right? Then we have self-control. Um, we know that this is a virtue of maintaining personal discipline. It means a strong will, a motivation and avoidance of fear, hatred, lack of effort, temptation, self-deception, and also emotional response. It, it encompasses courage and good judgment. All right? Self-respect basically promotes self-control. If you respect yourself, then you are going to control yourself. You, you know um, where your limitations actually fall. Right? We, we have these are virtues um, that we are talking about. We have also what we, we call self-interest. Now, self-interest is being good and acceptable to oneself. When you are good and acceptable to yourself. Now, it is pursuing what is good for yourself. It is very ethical to possess self-interest. And that's why sometimes we go to school at the expense of our family members who need our help. And we spend all that money, even when you have already a degree, you go for your master's, others are languishing behind. Right? So, as per utilitarian theory, now, this interest should provide for the respect of others also. Even as you make decisions for self-interest, you must leave room for the respect of others. Now, duty ethics, remember, recognizes this aspect as duties to ourselves. Then only one can help others. That's when you can actually help others. So right ethicists stresses our rights to pursue our own good. Virtual ethics also accepts the importance of self-respect as a link to social practices. Important to, to understand. Now, so, it is actually related to ethical egoism. Now, in ethical ego egoism, the self is conceived in a highly individualistic manner. It says, therefore, that every one of us should always and only promote one's own interest. Now, the ethical egoism do not accept the well-being of the community or caring for others. However, we must take note that um, this self-interest should not generate into egoism or selfishness. For example, where you actually tend to maximize only your own good in the pursuit of self-interest. So, if you are going to school, go to school because you want to have more money or to have a better job to help others. Not to go to school and say, I want the whole family to know that I'm capable of doing this. Right? So, the ethical egoism holds that the society benefits to the maximum when, number one, the individuals pursue their personal good. And also, number two, the individual organization pursue maximum profit in a competitive what? 
enterprise as a result of your undertaking. So this basically is claimed to improve the economy of the country as a whole, besides, you know, the individuals. We learn for others. So in such pursuit, we realize that independence is not the only important value. As human beings, we are also interdependent. As much as independent, each of us is vulnerable in society. Therefore, self-respect includes recognition of our vulnerabilities and our interdependencies. We need to take note of that. So, hence, it is compatible, therefore, with caring for ourselves as well as others. Self-interest, though, is necessary initially to begin with, but it should be one of the primary motives for our actions. The other motive, therefore, is to show concern for others in the family as well as in society. Now, one self-interest should not harm others. Your self-interest should never at any time harm others. So the principles of live and let others live and reasonably fair competition are recommended to professionals by um, people who study ethics. Right? So basically there are two types of egoism. There is what they call um, psychological egoism and also ethical egoism. In psychological egoism, the emphasis, emphasis is we do act in our own self-interest. While in ethical egoism is we should act in our own self-interest. We do, we should. Basically, those are the, um, the distinction between the two. So what is the remedy for ethical egoism? Because it may create problems in society especially when you are advantaged as a new brother. Now, the, the best example is Jesus Christ himself. Remember his self-giving self -giving love, which we regard as, as Christian as the supreme counter-example to egoism. Right? Now, the Bible basically appeals to our self-interest and warns about consequences of unbelief and our actions. When you look, read Luke 10, um, verse 27, and Ephesians 5, verse 28, it, it commands us to, to love others more than ourselves. In Ecclesiastes 2, verse 1 to 11, Solomon tries egoism. I tried everything, but it was all vain. It proved vanity. Prato, the Republican, also advocated that only with the non-egoistic ruler is a just society possible. In our governance system, as long as we do not have egoistic, we, as long as we have egoistic rulers, we will not have a just society. Okay? And therefore, he proposed to train a ruling class in whom egoism could not actually be found. Right? Okay. In the issue, in issues of ethics is also the aspect of customs. Now, in, in, we, we call this ethical pluralism. There, there are various cultures in our pluralistic society that lead to tolerance for various beliefs, various customs and outlooks. Now, accordingly, ethical pluralism also exists. Although many moral attitudes appear to be reasonable, what we find is that the rational and morally concerned people in most cases cannot fully accept any one of their uh, perspectives. What are we saying here? We are saying that there are many very varied moral values which allow variations in the understanding and application of values by individuals, by groups in our everyday transaction, even as we transact with life. So therefore it means that um, even reasonable people will not agree on all moral issues and professional ethics. 
They will not do that. Because we differ where we come from and how we have been oriented. Alright? So, then we, we talk about ethical relativism according to, to this principle. Actions are considered morally right when appro approved by law or by custom. And wrong when they violate the laws or customs. So, so therefore, the deciding factor is the law. It is the customs of the society. Therefore, should we accept the principle of relativism or not? A few reasons to accept may be cited here. What are they? Number one, basically relativism assumes that the values are subjective at the cultural level. Now, what are we saying here? We are saying moral standards, in one way or the other, vary from culture to culture. What is right in one culture may not be right in another culture. Therefore, the objectivity is supported by the existing laws of that particular society. The relative morality accepted. All this supports the virtue of tolerance of differences among society. So, this argument is also not fully accepted. Now, as per ethical relativism, we, we understand that um, the actions and the laws of, for, exa for example, those who have studied history, the actions and the laws of the Nazis and the, and the Hitlers who vowed on anti-Semitism and killed several million Jews would actually be accepted as right. It may be accepted as right. Okay? Secondly, laws appear to be objective ways for judging values. What are we saying here? We are saying when we have an application of the law, the customs, all these tend to be definite. They tend to be clear and real. But not always. Now, further we understand that moral reasons in most cases allow objective uh, criticism of laws as being morally lacking. And we can cite an example here um, from the, the apartheid laws in South Africa, which violated the human rights of the native Africans. Therefore, there was no legal protection that was available for native citizens for a long, long, long time. Now, of course, we understand that these laws have been repealed and, and, and people live in harmony. The third one is uh, that uh, the fact that moral relativism or moral contextualization um, is one of those aspects. Now, according to, to this particular um, element, the moral judgments must be made in relation to certain factors which may vary from case to case. What are we saying here? We are saying the morality, the, 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 the morally important factors for making any judgment that you need to make include the laws, the customs, the virtue ethicists, those, those who believe in virtue ethics, they actually hold that, you know, the, 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 the practical wisdom should prevail upon assessing the facts and in that particular judgment that is being assessed. Right. Okay, so let's look at now the role of religion in ethics. Right. Now, religions have played major roles in shaping moral values, moral views and moral values over geographical uh, regions. You discover that whatever Adventists believe in in Zambia is what they may believe in in America, in Asia, and the like. So when there are a set of values that need to be followed, you are sure that for that particular section of society as the Adventists or Muslims, all over the world, they may be in conformity with what has been laid down. So we know that Christianity has influenced the Western countries. Islam in the Middle East countries, Buddhism and Hinduism in Asia, and, and, and in China we know that uh, Confucianism is, is at play there. Now, 
there is also a strong psychological link that we find in literature between you know the moral and the, the religious beliefs of people following various religions and faiths. And so religions support moral responsibilities in one way or the other. They, they have set high moral standards. So faith in the religions provides trust and this trust inspires people to be moral. If you are a Christian, most of what is what we, we regard as morals may be um, you know, generated from scriptures, right? So the religions insist on tolerance and moral consent for others. Men professionals who possess religious beliefs are motivated to be morally responsible. So each religion lays stress on certain high standards. For example, Hinduism actually holds um, polytheism. By polytheism, we mean you know many gods. Okay, that's what they view. And virtues of devotion and surrender to higher order. What about Christianity? Christians basically believe in one deity, one God. And they emphasize on virtues of love, faith, hope, and many, many other virtues that we can mention here. Buddhism, we know that it is non-theistic um, and, and basically focuses on compassion and, and Islam on one deity and adherence of, of Ishna, um, you know, and prayer. Judaism stresses the value of virtue, right? What they call um, Sedaka or righteousness. Um, and this, this actually brought problems during the time of Jesus. Okay? But many religious sects have adopted poor moral standards. And, and we know that, especially in the Pentecostal churches, we, we, we find a lot of, you know, I was watching a video of a pastor who was actually sucking a woman's breast because he claimed that that is the only way the woman would, would actually be healed. Right? So, some, moreover, have, have adopted poor moral standards. For example, many religious sects do not recognize equal rights for women. Okay? The right to worship is denied for some people. People are killed in the name of or to promote religion, like Israel. Therefore, conflicts exist between the secular and the religious people, and between one religion and another. Hence, Religious views have to be morally scrutinized. Right? <coughs> Sorry. There, there, there is also what we call divine commands ethics. Now, divine commands ethics, as, as it relates to religion here, as per this principle, the, the right action is defined by the commands by God. What God said entails right action. And this, this is what we tend to see in the Bible. Right? When God led the children of Israel, he demanded of them to listen to them. And if God needed to communicate to the larger uh, uh, section of the Israelis, he needed to communicate through uh, Moses and Moses will say, This is what God has said. So, failure to obey that is what led them to be in trouble in their journey. So, it implies that to be moral, a person should believe in God, and an action is right only if it is commanded by God. Therefore, there are some difficulties in this particular approach. Namely, Number one, if we need to listen to God, does God really exist? Sometimes it's not clear. Even as Christians, sometimes we tend to forget, does he really exist? Why am I in this situation? It may create problems. Secondly, how to know what are the, God, what are the God's commands? Is this really what God says we should or we should not do. Thirdly, how to verify the genuineness of the commands. 
I know that among Adventists, even when we want to 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 see who is a true prophet, we have what we say we, we tests of a pro, true prophet. You know, you shall know them by their fruits. So further, religions, religions such as Hinduism, uh, Islam, and Christianity, it, it, they, they tend to accept the existence of God in one or the other. But we know that for Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism, they, they have adopted only faith in a right path and not to believe in any particular God. Okay? So, for Socrates, he was said to have argued that God, an entity which is responsible, morally good, and beyond fear or favor, would not command murder, would not command rape, would not command torture, immoral activities, and even mass suicide. That if we have these vices, they do not come from God, according to Socrates, because God will not command such. So there, there, are, there, there are many such crimes that are committed in the name of God, especially among, you know, some extreme Pentecostals and, and even Islam. Okay? So, to, so they, they commit all these in the name of God then, and they continue even now in different parts of the world. Some Western leaders had claimed also that... Um, God had commanded them to invade against the Middle East countries. If anyone claims to have obtained commands from God to kill, people's, to kill people in a merciless manner, then we have to conclude that the person is not religious, but is insane. Right? Okay. According to Palok, 2007, he mentions four assumptions of divine command theory. Number one, that there is a God that we should believe. Two, that God commands and forbids certain acts. Number three, an action is right according to Pollock. Pollock an action is right if God commands it. If he doesn't, then it's wrong. So if we keep on praying and God is not answering to the request that we are making, then he has not accepted that. Number four, people are certain what God commands or forbids. Logic. Right? What about Barry, um, as cited by Palok? He describes that Understanding God's will is done in three ways. Number one, through divine individual conscience. We have the conscience. We, we make decisions on our own, even as, as we get inspired. Number two, by religious authorities. And number three, through holy scriptures. So when we, we do that, we, when you know those are some of the three ways by which um, we can have an understanding of God's will. All right? Okay. Um, again, we come back to the issue of self-respect. Now, self-respect is defined as valuing oneself in morally suitable ways. It includes recognizing um, which means respecting others, their ideas, their decisions, abilities, and rights. Appraisal which means properly valuing ourselves as to how well we face moral standards and our moral commitments, our aims in life. So, therefore, an intensive but balanced feeling of self-respect is a sense of honor. This includes intense agony and guilt for wrongdoing. Self-respect. We need to have that virtue. Especially even as we uh, as, as we, we we progress in our teaching career, because when we self-respect ourselves, we are going to respect our demonstrators, our students. We will not engage ourselves in silly activities among with, with the students that have become prominent in in the teaching fraternity. So self-control, remember, is a virtue of maintaining personal discipline or self-regulation. Courage is a byproduct of 
byproduct of self-respect, which means which makes a person face the hardship in a rational manner. Self-respect is different from self-extreme esteem um, in one way or the other. Let's see how self-respect differs from self-extreme esteem. Now, self-respect is a moral concept, while self-esteem is a psychological concept. Self-respect has to do with valuing yourself in a morally suitable way. Self-esteem is having a positive attitude towards yourself. It may be excessive or unwarranted or normal. Self-respect includes virtues of, re of recognition and appraisal. It promotes virtues of sense of honor, self-control, and also courage. Basically, these are the, the, the differences between self-respect and self-esteem. So, we, we know that um, even as, as we have talked about virtues, there, there are modern theories of virtues that um, uh, have been developed over time. Um, for example, uh, when we talk about Kobeck's and Gillig's theories, all these are based on development of moral um, autonomy. But, you know, there are other scholars and thinkers that have put forward theories that highlight the virtues and their impact on, on ethical behavior of people. Um, and we talk here about theories of virtues and practice by um, Mark Tynes. Um, that says that action, acts are morally right when they support relevant virtues, making possible the achievement of social goals. Um, this gentleman believes that um, Aristotle's list of integrity, unity, honesty, self-respect, and responsibility and accountability are very, very vital. Um, uh, this, this is what um, Aristotle actually mentioned. Then the theory of act, uh, we, we, we already saw um, the, 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 the theory of act utilitarianism by Mill and also by Brandt um, and will not spend so much, um, so much time there. The theory of validity of, of principles of duty, just a summary of what we have discussed, the theory of rights, the theory of community-related rights. Now, this, this theory says that having more rights presupposes the capacity to show certain to others and be accountable for um, communitary. Now, th this is more or less the same as what uh, Chanakya mentions, the well-known authority on political doctrines and, um, and the author of the Chanakya myth. What did he say? He says that sacrifice, sacrifice the individual for the sake of the family. Sacrifice the family for the sake of the village and sacrifice the village for the sake of the nation. Right? Great thinking, isn't it? Right. So what can we, how, how can we bring to a summary of these theories, therefore? Now, in short, the theories that we have so far discussed, um, modern theories can be classified into four groups. They, they can be virtual theories, as we saw, utilitarian theories, and, um, and, and also um, duty theories and, and, and rights theories. And, and here is presented um, a table that has just, um, all right, okay, that, that has distinction on these part, types of, 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 of theories. And, and, and others talk about existentialism. This is a philosophical belief that states that, states that we are each responsible for creating purposes or meaning in our own lives, all right? So this is, a, this is, this is also a, a, philosophical, um, um, a philosophical undertaking where our individual purpose and meaning is not given to us by God, according to existentialists. It's not given to us by governments. It's not given to us by teachers or any other authorities that we belong to. But, um, you know, important in that account are the claims that when you talk about moral values, they are created rather than discovered. So we create moral values. So, so also moral responsibility is more extensive than usually assumed and, and also 
Moral life should not be a matter of, of following rules, per se. Then there's the, the deontology, um, the, the, the deontological class of ethical theories state that people should adhere to their obligations and duties when engaged in decision making, when ethics are actually up at play. What, what, what is the implication here is that, um, the implication is that a person will follow his or her obligations to another individual or society because upholding one's duty is what is considered ethical, right? For instance, dentologists will always keep their promises to a friend and they will follow the law to the latter. So a person who adheres to the ontological theory will produce very consistent decisions since they will be based on the individual's what? Set duties. Okay? And then we have situationalism. Um, you know, this was a Kregman. Uh, it, it was advocated by Joseph Fletcher, who was a, a, a Kregman from a background of risks. Um, he talks about rule ethics as being important, but reacted against dogmatism. He actually suggested that human beings cannot be jacketed into one situation. You cannot jacket a human being in one situation. There is no one law which is good and applicable to every person or situation. Okay? So, therefore, what is important is love. Love for the person Love for people. Love that helps us to do the right thing for others is what Fletcher actually um, uh, emphasizes. Okay? So the fundamental message of Fletcher's theory um, are that uh, only love is intrinsically good for human beings. The ruling norm in human decision-making is love. Love and justice are the same. Right? Because why? Justice is love distributed. Okay? Love wills and the neighbor's good. The end justifies the what? The means. Life's decision is made situational. So we cannot remain in one position for all the time in our lives. So there are merits to Fletcher's theory. Uh, he believes that human beings are equal and not to be forced into one 